1965. A young engineer, just in his 30s, working at Fairchild Semiconductor, writes an audacious paper predicting that the number of transistors on a chip will double every year for at least a decade. That prediction becomes enshrined as Moore's Law and lasts not just for one decade, but for more than five decades. It changes the world we live in. Without it, there are no personal computers. That integrated circuit revolution brought us the internet, made everything possible, including video games. You can't win them all. <laughs> and Gordon Moore was behind that revolution. There was lots of hard work. It didn't just happen because somebody predicted it. There was lots of engineering. There was lots of creativity and ingenuity. And Gordon played a key role, both in the basic technology and, of course, in founding and leading Intel. That's an incredible history. But it set the stage for an even more incredible history that Gordon and Betty have accomplished through the establishment of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. That foundation was equally audacious in setting bold goals. And it is really critically illustrated by a few key points that they put in their founder's letter. They want to have a foundation that made significant difference in the world, that tried to do big things, that justified and thought about real change in the world, that focused on important issues, that looked at measurable impact and change and endurable impact in the world. They wanted to have a foundation that was based on the scientific method and the rigor that science brings and used science all the time. Thank God we have that, at least on the West Coast. <laughs> now, I'm tempted to take Gordon and put him in a bottle and send him back east and have him educate some people, but <laughs> it may not work. In one interview, Gordon said, governments are too conservative. They can't get new things started, but a foundation with the ability to do something new and to take a long-term view can. And that was the beginning of their conservation efforts. Why conservation? Well, they were motivated personally by what they saw as environmental degradation and destruction. Gordon and Betty made conservation and environmental work a key area for their foundation. And for the past 15 years, the foundation has done incredible work, changing and preserving our environment. For example, the foundation's wild salmon ecosystems initiative has preserved incredible amounts of areas in the North Pacific critical to salmon and other habitats. Looking in another area, the Andes Amazon, one of the most critical environmental areas on our planet, home to more than 30 million people, 10% of the species in the world, and 20% of our freshwater supply. In the past 15 years, the foundation has managed to preserve 170 million hectares of space, four times the size of the state California. But their environmental efforts go beyond just preserving land to think about how do we fundamentally change the way people regard the environment? How do we prevent slash and burn harvesting of the rainforest so that we keep that rainforest for future generations? How do we think about how we harvest seafood so that our children will be able to get fresh food from the sea, just as we've been able to? 
Gordon and Betty have seen opportunities where others saw problems. They focused on improving the quality of healthcare in our hospitals, a, an initiative which is focused very much on the critical role that nurses play, Betty's own career and experience. Through the Betty and Irene Moore nursing initiative, they helped increase the quality of healthcare in all our local hospitals, reducing central line infections, and reducing the number of readmissions to hospitals, a critical issue in our healthcare system. And of course, they also made an enormous step helping to create the Betty and Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis at a time when nurses have become more important than ever and where we in California were facing a shortage of qualified nurses. Gordon's passion for science and research and new learning has also empowered activities that the foundation has done in terms of financing science. Whether it's building instruments for new discovery, like the 30 meter telescope, or new ways to understand the structure of the atom, new accelerator technologies. The foundation has focused heavily on investing in these. But Gordon and Betty also are long-term residents of our community, of the Bay Area. And they've invested heavily in the local community, promoting and investing in museums, in our science museums, from the tech up to the exploratorium, and also in preserving what I think we all value, the incredible open space that we have in this community. That's a legacy that will go on to benefit all of us and our children. The Moors have said that they want their philanthropic endeavors to improve life, not just for the present, but for those that are 10,000 years, here 10,000 years from now. Now you might think, that's ambitious. We can't predict what's going to happen in the world 100 or 10,000 years from now. But if you think about what they've invested in through the foundation, they actually have thought about the long term. Think about the investment in the environment and preserving the incredible environmental environment, the quality of our environment for generations to come, not just for our children, but for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And think about the role of science in laying the foundation for discoveries so that we will be able to solve the problems that we face in the years ahead. This foundation is really an incredible legacy. I cannot imagine two more deserving people than Gordon and Betty Moore to win the Global Impact Award. Their work through the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation will change all our lives here in the Bay Area and around the world for us and for the generations to come. Please join me in welcoming a legend in his own time and a true tall tree, Gordon Moore. Well, thank you. Truly an honor to give this award. Betty is sorry she couldn't come, but she doesn't travel easily anymore. But for her to get a tall tree award is really exciting. You have to recognize she said she was above five feet when we got married. <laughs> but after 67 years of marriage, we've taken a few inches off of that. <laughs> I thought... <laughs> we have a long local history. Uh, Betty was raised in Los Gatos an area that's now part of San Jose. Uh, I spent my first 10 years in Pescadero and moved to Redwood City, where my parents lived until they died. I remember playing football against Pally in the Stanford Stadium. <laughs> well, the more, Actually, I was really watching the football game from the bench most of the time. 
But it was a unique experience. I don't remember who won, which undoubtedly means Sequoia didn't. <laughs> I thought tonight maybe something I could do is reflect a bit on Palo Alto's unique role in the history of Silicon Valley. Uh, this is a non-Stanford centric view of how Silicon Valley came to prosper. <laughs> Uh, certainly, Stanford played an important role in the general industry. Hewlett Packard and Varian were two major companies that were formed very early. But they were kind of regular companies. They stayed together for a long period of time uh, with uh, significant growth, but without impacting the surroundings quite so much. The Silicon Valley effect, where every engineer thinks he should be an entrepreneur, uh, is something that developed around here uh, more or less accidentally. Uh, it began when William Sockley, Shockley, one of the inventors of the transistor, set up his laboratory on San Antonio Road. Uh, he had the idea of making a silicon transistor of a type that was not available at that time any place in the world, but had considerable potential. So he brought the silicon to the valley. Then he hired a bunch of us young scientists, generally not engineers in those days, because there was no technology that the universities had in place. Stanford had to send a young assistant professor to work with Shockley to learn enough about semiconductors so they could start a program. Uh, that was Jim Gibbons, who eventually became Dean of Engineering. Anyhow, uh, Shockley brought the silicon. Uh, he was a great physicist, but turned out to have some Unique management characteristics that didn't sound very well. The story's been told several times. But a group of us, uh, colloquially known as the Traitorous Eight, finally decided we couldn't live with Shockley anymore. And we set out on our own. That was the formation of Fairchild Semiconductor. My Parkinson pill is wearing off. I <laughs> um, Shockley got his financing from Arnold Beckman, from Beckman Instruments. And Beckman wanted him to set up his operation in Southern California. Shockley insisted that Northern California was superior, a better place with some of his limitations. So, Shockley pushed it to have it up here. Beckman acquiesced. It could have been, instead of Palo Alto, Fullerton, if you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Fairchild was the source of this explosion of entrepreneurs. I think they each felt if the original group of eight of us could make progress, they could do it too, because they were obviously at least as good as we were. And that has become the driving force for the industry. We got new companies forming right and left. Every engineer thinks he can run a company. And there were enough new ideas to give them opportunities. And this all happened because of one fact. Shockley's mother lived in Palo Alto, and he wanted to be close to her. That is a driving force for why it's Silicon Valley around here rather than in Southern California. Well, thank you very much again, and keep up the good work. <laughs>